Good evening. I'm your host, Karen Hudis, and today is July 21. This is the 12th segment in the series on the network of global corporate control. I'm coming to you live from DC TV's studios here in Washington, and this is a hot, muggy day. Uh, we're looking forward possibly to a thunderstorm, and maybe in the broadcast you'll think some of what we have to say is our own version of uh, thunder and lightning. In uh, DC TV's July newsletter, uh, this show was named as the uh, video of the month, which I'm very proud of. And I want to thank again the uh, crew that's been helping me. And uh, Carmen Stanley is uh, back in the studio manning the uh, slots. Tonight, I'm happy to say we've got our uh, teleprompter. A couple of the shows, uh, something happened mysteriously just before we went on air. Uh, let's say a little bit about the um, uh, cartoon that you see up there. Um, I've mentioned to you that one of the ways to find out whether the Coalition for the Rule of Law was winning in the battle that we have against the network of global corporate control was whether there was um, more understanding that there's something wrong with the mainstream media. Um, and there certainly is. Uh, some people want to know whether the network of global corporate control is a good thing. It most certainly is not. That's the title of uh, an article that was written by three mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology that looked at the data of who owns all of the 40,000 companies on the capital markets of the world. They found out that there was one group that was in control. They call it a super entity and it was in control of 40% of the assets and 60% of the earnings, and that that group had bought up all of the media, uh, not only the mainstream media, but also the alternative media, and was censoring the news. And that's why, if you want to find out what's going on, you have to uh, listen to DCTV and some of the uh, uh, things that you can find on the internet. Um, and I'd like to say that if you have any questions, um, please contact me on my contact page uh, from my website, and I'll be happy to answer questions. We've also put up uh, eight of the broadcasts on YouTube, and there's been a fair amount of questions raised there, uh, which you'll see. It's, um, we're documenting every, every single thing that we tell you. Uh, the last episode uh, from the July 7th program was taped on June 30th, and on that day, I had stopped off at the uh, World Bank headquarters. I was in the World Bank legal department for 21 years and um, was reinstated. I was fired for blowing the whistle on corruption, very deep corruption at the World Bank. Um, any staff member who tried to tell the board of executive directors what was going on was um, given, uh, <laughs> given the pink slip, including uh, accountants that were saying that the interest bills were overcharged. Uh, there was, it was just not working the way a bank is supposed to work. And I knew that this was a problem. And so I reported all of the corruption up the corporate ladder to the audit committee I went to the U.S. Treasury. Um, I exhausted all of the remedies, and I did what a lawyer is supposed to do when they're working inside uh, a company which has um, bonds traded on the capital markets, because you have to have assurance that the financial statements are accurate. And there was no way to know what the financial statements really were, because uh, any, anybody who tried to correct errors would be fired, including um, a Scottish whistleblower named Elaine Colville, who found out that her unit was um, being charged twice. So that meant that uh, somebody was taking the charges of her entire unit and was spending it whichever way they wanted. That, uh, that didn't work. So um, I made a fair amount of noise. And after a while, I found my way to the alternative media. And then what happened was that um, I was contacted by uh, Wolfgang Struck, 
who told me that the World Bank and the IMF were created in order to administer all of the world's gold in a trust fund that was set up um, by a young lawyer named Ferdinand Marcos. And it was Jose Rizal who had actually uh, been something called the Black Pope in the um, Vatican who had taken the um, gold that the Vatican had at its disposal. Uh, and this is a lot more gold than people know about because uh, human history stretches back um, many, many, many more centuries than people know about. It stretches back to the previous Ice Age, and we've discussed in this series about a map that was discovered, the Hapgood maps um, from the 1500s that show the um, coastline of Australia and Antarctica that you couldn't see it because it was buried under an ice cap. These maps, it showed that there was a, a good cartographer uh, in the previous ice age. And of course, you can see ruins off the coasts as well. Um, now, I wanted to show you um, the dollar bill. And that is a special dollar bill. It's a Federal Reserve note, and it shows what the value is of um, the US dollar vis-a-vis -vis gold. And <laughs> what happened in the very middle, that was the Civil War. And then um, in the 30s, when gold was confiscated, you see a flat line. And then um, the value of the dollar continued to, um, to diminish. And um, three of our presidents were assassinated in trying to replace this unconstitutional currency. John F. Kennedy uh, signed something called the Green-Hilton Agreement, and he was assassinated uh, eight days after he signed that. He was going to get the gold that is administered by the World Bank and the IMF, um, placed at the disposal of the United States, and eight days later he was assassinated. Uh, Ronald Reagan was shot by Hinckley. What Ronald Reagan had done was first he commissioned a study to see where the uh, income taxes were going. He found out that 100% of those income taxes were going to um, outside the country. They were going to the network of global corporate control. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we are going to complete the unfinished business. Um, what I've been tweeting um, was about uh, my discussion with the DC police um, because They've been preventing me from going back to my desk after 188 ministers of finance settled a lawsuit that I brought, bought. I bought a World Bank bond, and then I sued under the securities laws because I knew that the financial statements of the World Bank were incorrect. And um, I couldn't go back inside the World Bank because the security guards are owned by the network of global corporate control. That's a group called Allied Barton. And I, in the previous episode, on the 30th of June, I gave a very detailed uh, report about um, how the uh, DC police, after I had already gone to um, various groups inside the DC government, I went to the DC council, um, I had gone to Dave Zvenya, and he was fired after I reported his corruption. Um, I've gone to um, the board of ethics and government accountability, I've, um, anyway, uh, I've gone to the DC police um, many, many times, and Melvin Gresham uh, threw me out of the spring meetings, which happened in um, April this year. Uh, what I then did was I just walked around to, uh, outside the building, I walked around and spoke to all of the, um, the limousine drivers to tell them about um, following up on the letters that I had written to the ministers of finance. 188 of them are on the board of governors. And I've been writing to them. I've been writing to the ambassadors for many, many years. Um, and what I've recently been doing, uh, I tried the US Congress, and uh, that didn't work because it turns out that, there's, uh, that the United States has been under martial law since 1861. And there was a second secret constitution that came into place in 1871 which is uh, when the Revolutionary War debts came due. Um, we never really made it um, to be independent from our uh, being a colony from the United Kingdom. And as a matter of fact, the United Kingdom um, has been tied to the Vatican ever since um, the Magna Carta, which 
was a breach of an agreement that King James had with the Pope. And so um, that's why many of the tax dollars that um, go outside the country end up at the Vatican. And um, this is a big scam because we really should not have to be paying interest on our currency. When the currency is issued directly by the treasuries, then um, the countries themselves get to keep the difference between the face amount of the uh, currency and what it costs to print. That's called seniorage. And right now, the bankers get to keep that. That's a scam. And then they get to charge interest on the debt. So all of the discussions that we've been having with Greece has been over um, a scam. So I'd like to tell you what we'll be talking about today. We're going to be talking about my discussions with uh, the mayor of DC, Major, Mayor Muriel Bowser, uh, and whether the District of Columbia is going to lose its biggest employer, the World Bank and IMF, because of this corruption that I've been talking about on this series. Um, we're going to talk about a fight that I've been having with the World Bank webmaster about whether it's the Board of Governors who run the World Bank or whether the webmaster can hide their contact information. And we're also going to talk about a report on human rights to the United States State Department uh, on yesterday. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in Greece. Uh, just before the broadcast at 5 o'clock, I got a call from uh, Gabriel Johnson um, because I had asked to schedule a meeting with um, Mayor Bowser. And uh, so Gabriel wanted to know who was going to be at the meeting, um, whether I was going to bring anybody from the World Bank. And I said, well, I would certainly be very happy to bring somebody from the World Bank. But first, she had to make sure that um, Melvin Gresham didn't arrest me when I went <laughs> into, the, into the building. Um, in addition to being the acting general counsel of there's um, five agencies of the World Bank, the oldest one is called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And that's where I'm the acting general counsel. I was given that position first in 2009 by the executive directors after the executive directors were uh, blackmailed for firing Paul Wolfowitz for giving a big pay raise to his um, uh, girlfriend, Shaha Riza, who worked at the World Bank. So um, <laughs> you've, you've, you've got to hand it to the network of global corporate control. They, um, they like to run a tight ship. And uh, so let me tell you about how this uh, conversation with, um, with Mayor Bowser's office went. Um, I had been sending them uh, copies of correspondence that I had with the county executives of America. Um, this group it consists of the county executives that are directly elected by the counties. There are about 700 of them, those counties, and the, the rest of the 3,000 and so counties um, have a, a different way of appointing their county executive. So um, back in uh, last summer, I contacted the county executives of America and I asked them to accept the gold that belongs to the United States that's in um, its 170,000 metric tons. There's a certificate that's on deposit in um, the Bank of Hawaii but most of the gold is buried in the Philippines. How did the gold get there? Um, that's because um, Jose Rizal, uh, when he went back to the Philippines from the Vatican, um, this was right uh, between World War I and World War II, um, a lot of the Vatican's gold was buried in the Philippines. And um, I received reports that some of that gold was now being um, flown away. The uh, US military is guarding that area. Some of the gold is in the central bank of the Philippines, but some of the gold is buried. And you can tell if you're flying satellites exactly wh where in the Philippines that gold will be because it's going to light up like a Christmas tree. Um, so um, I wrote to um, the US military. I've been in touch with them many, many times because since we're under martial rule, the person who would, would be there to mint the uh, currency out of gold 
is the um, Secretary of the Army. So um, I've been trying to get this off the ground quickly because Federal Reserve notes are not going to continue um, very much longer. They're going to crash. And this, this, was, um, this was deliberate. They wanted to have a unilateral surrender of the United States. But um, the World Bank is a knowledge bank. And one of the things that came to the World Bank in 2004 from a political scientist named Jacek Kugler was a very accurate power transition model, which showed that it was possible to fight the corruption. Um, I looked at the model inside the World Bank um, and later found out that Jacek had done this model um, on, a global, um, on a global model. He had done this for the Department of Defense. And it shows now that the Coalition for the Rule of Law, which consists of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, Germany, Japan, and the United States minus the Federal Reserve, that this coalition for the rule of law is going to, um, it, we're much stronger than the network of global corporate control, and we are going to, um, we're going to be the ones to determine, in accordance with what the Board of Governors in the Bretton Woods wants, we're going to be determining what happens to the gold. And that's what we've already done. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to take the gold and give it uh, as their monetary gold reserves to each of the countries. We're not talking about a one world order, just the opposite. We also want to have local currencies that are issued by the local villages and uh, towns and jurisdictions. Any place where a group of businesses will agree among themselves that they will accept, uh, and tr it's like a barter system for the local goods and services. So um, anyway, um, I, I discussed all of this and the fact that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated because he was trying to make this gold that belongs to the United States citizenry to make this available to us. Um, and I said, so this, there's no reason and no way to lock me out of the building and prevent the world's people from getting their gold back to them. Um, and I've had a number of people writing to me um, to, see, to say, well, am I going to get it, um, you know, is, is somebody going to come and give each person gold? No, it's going to be inside your currency. And what we have to do is we have to calculate very carefully what the value is of gold, because gold does not change uh, value. Uh, and we have to price the gold vis-a-vis -vis the goods and services over, over centuries in the various currencies. I've asked UNCTAD to do this calculation for us. And then we're going to have to price the currencies vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, and this is not going to happen overnight, obviously. But we do have a forum to discuss these issues. That is um, the Bretton Woods institutions. And uh, many people distrust these institutions because uh, they're looking at the institutions as they've been captured by the network of global corporate control. Um, so I wanted to tell you about what happened with um, the webmaster at the World Bank. Um, when people started contacting the executive directors, there's 25 of them that are resident, and the f biggest eight countries each get their own dedicated executive director, and then the rest of the countries share in something called constituencies. So people were, a lot of people, I think, were interested in finding out from their executive directors about um, what was going on with the global currency reset. So um, when I tried to find out, um, answer this question, I found out that the, um, the contact information for the executive directors was being hidden. <laughs> so um, I, I then tweeted this, and then the webmaster restored that information, but in, a, in an obscure way. You, you couldn't get it right from the, um, the home page. You had to know which of the various links to click. So um, yeah, that's, um, that's really quite shocking. But then, actually, I, I, I found it also, in addition to being shocking, I, I found it amusing that uh, they thought they could get away with that. Um, then the next thing I found out, when I was trying to show that it's actually the Board of Governors under the Articles of the World Bank and the executive directors that are in charge of running the organization, I found out that you couldn't, when you um, do a search for the articles of the World Bank, 
you, you wouldn't get that information. You would get a series of resolutions instead. You, you have to do a search engine outside the, um, the World Bank um, web, web page. That is absolutely preposterous. Um, so <laughs> there, um, there was an interesting thing that happened in 2009 which was um, the World Bank set up a task force and then tried to abolish the board of um, executive directors. Um, that was through something called the Zadio Commission. I, I found actually Mr. Zadio, um, he's one of the group of 300, or sorry, the committee of 300. That is a group of royalty. Uh, now the, the thing, the reason that um, I think Jose Rizal was able to get this gold back in the trust is because of um, what happened with, between the royalty and the bankers. The bankers um, gave certificates to the royalty um, and told the royalty that they had to relinquish their gold in exchange for these certificates because of the war and the fact that the gold was going to be taken from them. So they did this and now um, these are called Treaty of Versailles certificates. Uh, these certificates have ended up in the global um, debt facility and they're now worth quadrillions because the interest has been compounding. So whenever you talk about country debt, um, this, is, um, this is not only a scam, but the bankers owe us more than we owe them. Um, I wanted to, to talk about the cartoon of the week. Um, this is, um, it's up the creek without a paddle. And when you look at it, you see the, um, the bankers driving off with the paddles. Um, when I posted that on the internet, um, I said that actually the Coalition for the Rule of Law had put a hole in the tire of the, um, the bankers. They're not making off with our gold or our ability to handle the debt crisis. Um, that's because we, in the last spring meetings, although I was locked out of the building, I was able to go into the embassies and the Board of Governors agreed that we were going to put the, um, the network of global corporate control into receivership in the global debt facility. And then I filed financing statements. Um, before that, I did something called a notarial protest where I confronted um, Janet Yellen and um, I said, who is the one that has the, um, the global uh, monetary reserves of the world? Do you hold them? Is it in the um, Fort Knox? Don't forget, the Fed has not allowed anybody to audit these gold reserves. No, that's because the gold is all with the global debt facility. And that's why I was able to file financing statements with all of the um, states. There's actually 11 of them, not 12, because in, uh, in Missouri, you've got both the Federal Reserve of Kansas um, and the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. Um, but anyway, so um, they have absolutely no legal right to any of what they're doing. It's just that they have been bamboozling everybody. And this is, um, this is why I'm going to be going back inside the bank because Allied Barton, which is owned by the Network of Global Corporate Control, is actually in receivership. And I don't think after my conversation um, with uh, Mayor Bowser's office, I don't think that um, Melvin Gresham is going to prevent me from going in there anymore. And I think enough people inside the World Bank um, realize that um, too many people know about this corruption and they just cannot maintain it anymore. Even though they tried desperately with their uh, misleading information in the mainstream media. They're, they're just, um, they're not credible anymore. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the uh, human rights report um, that went to the State Department. I said that that report had to be corrected because of the fact that our human rights are violated, um, that the federal courts that we go to, uh, the judges have broken their oaths of office. And what we have is um, the judges are employees of the network of global corporate control, and they're uh, presiding over administrative courts, 
And what they did was um, when you sign your signature on the bank signature card, underneath there, there's um, in fine writing, it says subject to bank rules. And if you find out what those bank rules are, hidden in there uh, is the statement that you have waived your right to the Article Three courts under the Constitution. And this is not working. Enough people know that, the, uh, that this, this has happened. I actually went to the US Congress, to the Senate um, Judiciary Committee, and tried to get them to own up to this, and they, they wouldn't. Um, so we're going to have some very um, difficult conversations with our representatives. Um, fortunately, the United States Constitution has a provision, Article 5, which says that we can um, rescind this second secret constitution and put the original constitution back into effect, which would have our rights. But uh, getting back to this uh, State Department report, clearly um, we have a serious problem with human rights in the United States. Um, so let's now talk, um, let, do we have time, uh, Carmen, to run the uh, brief clip on um, Queen Elizabeth? Uh, and the reason why I think this is important, I'll, I'll let you see this now. Go ahead, run it. Yes, that is a Nazi salute from the seven-year-old um, Elizabeth. Um, and the reason why I think this is very important is somebody in a very senior position made that available to the British um, newspaper, The Sun. So you see that there is a lot of shuffling going on uh, because the, um, the one percenters realize that we, <laughs> we are onto them. And um, what I said to um, Mayor Bowser's office is that this is going to be a peaceful transition. That's the only way that it will work. So um, if people disagree with that, we can certainly have these discussions. But I think you'll have to recognize that um, we, we would much rather uh, not have another dark age. And if the price for that is, um, and I'm not saying forgive these people. I'm saying you have to find out precisely what it is they did. I'm not trying to hide anything that the uh, one percenters have done. But I do think we need, um, we need to focus on the future and not on uh, re retaliation or retribution. Uh, now, there's only one minute left. Um, there's not much time to talk about Greece. But the important thing to say about Greece is that Greece is standing in there for all of us. There's nothing special about Greece. Um, and we all are backing Greece um, because they have, they have been, um, the rates of suicide have, have been astronomic. Um, they've been deprived of so much. And, um, and just for a scam, when um, the former Minister of Finance, Mr. Yanis Varoufakis, was um, asked to step down, I wondered whether he, you know, he's an expert in game theory. I wondered whether he might have done so because of, um, because of how he knew the likelihood that we were going to um, end this corruption. I want to thank you for watching another segment of the Network of Global Corporate Control. We've discussed the battle between the Coalition for the Rule of Law and the Network of Global Corporate Control. I've said that you can measure progress in the numbers that are catching on, that there's a lot going on behind the mainstream media's screen of propaganda. Everybody seems to realize that the Greek debt crisis is just the tip of the iceberg. Next week's segment will look into the way that the legal accounting professions and journalists have been complicit in the cover-up. Until next week, I'm your host, Karen Hudis. Thank you.
Good evening. This is Karen Hudis, and I'm your host for another segment on the Network of Global Corporate Control. This segment is called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. We're going to be talking about journalism, the legal profession, and the accounting profession. As far as the journalists go, um, We've been uh, discussing how the network of global corporate control bought up all of the media, the newspapers and the, uh, the movies. Uh, they've also been buying up the alternative media on the internet. Uh, when I was in law school, my professor of international law, Myers McDougall, teamed up with Harold Laswell who was also said to be the most original and productive sociologist and political scientist of his time. Laswell wanted to know who was in charge of the media and came up with control analysis to find out. He asked, who owns this newspaper? What are their aims? What are their political allegiances? Do they attempt to set editorial policy? Does the fact that they're a Republican account for the newspaper's repeated attacks on the royal family? Are they subject to any kind of legal constraints? How does the editor decide what to put in the paper? And we know whether the network of global corporate control is um, losing its edge when we see that people are turning their backs on the media, when they realize that this is really only propaganda. Um, it took me a long time to find out that the uh, mainstream media was not reliable. One of my old friends was the president of the National Press Club, Sonia Hilgren. And um, I, when, when she got very ill, um, I was working with her to try to, um, to publicize some of the corruption that was going on. I didn't realize at the time that the World Bank and the IMF were sitting on the monetary gold reserves of the world. But I did know that the World Bank and the IMF had a very important role to play in international finance. And having been trained on the capital markets, I knew that financial information had to flow. Uh, and one of the things that happened um, when Sonia died, the National Press Club celebrates their um, presidents. And so as one of Sonia's friends, I was uh, allowed to, um, to get to know some of the other leaders in the press club. And then what happened was um, I was trying to brief the Senate, the uh, Senate uh, Committee on uh, International Relations. And uh, so I, when, when uh, there was going to be a briefing at the press club, uh, I tried to, um, to go to that briefing. And uh, what happened was um, I was turned away at the door. Um, and I had, sent, um, I had sent an email to the then president of the World Bank. And um, he, couldn't, he couldn't be bothered to answer the email. But then I found out that he was complaining about the email that I had sent him. What I had sent him was a draft press release. So um, Robert Selleck's staff then uh, sent that press release to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Um, he was impersonating me. Uh, and they got very angry. Their uh, general counsel uh, sent me a letter saying that if I was going to be circulating that draft press release, um, that, uh, that they were going to sue me. And I said, well, actually, it wasn't me that was circulating this press release. I, I had marked very clearly at the top that it was a draft. It was Robert Zellick who was circulating the press release to try to get me in trouble with them. And then I went back to the National Press Club and I tried to get them to run with that story. Well, they wouldn't. Um, and, and just trying very hard to get the press club 
to report um, on the, the network of global corporate control, I finally gave up. I finally, it took me a long time because I just didn't want to believe that the corruption was as deep as it was. There's only one mainstream media publisher that has reported anything on me, and that is in Spanish. That's Newsweek on Espanol. And at a certain point, they took down what uh, their article, and then they put it back up again, thank goodness. Uh, and I've had people in my Twitter account say, well, Karen, um, so long as the mainstream media isn't reporting on you, um, there, must be, there must be something wrong with your story. Uh, and so um, what, I, what I say when I get that kind of argument is I quote a fellow named Richard Karpinski. Uh, in 2014, he wrote, Karen Hudis, the World Bank whistleblower, is still not showing up in the mainstream press. She makes reference to a study of global corporate control, which appears in Plus One in 2011. 147 of the 43,000 multinational corporations control 40% of the net worth of companies in world trade and 60% of their annual earnings. This is reported by three mathematicians at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Karen Hudis, World Bank Insider, reveals who's behind the throne. The degree of control of the mainstream press in suppressing stories of this magnitude certainly supports the Plus One paper in its conclusion that they constitute a single conglomerate by interlocking boards of directors. Uh, and I'm still quoting from Karpinski. She is on Facebook as well as on Google News and in many YouTube videos. This is likely to be a crazy year which could bring the world economy out of the bankster-caused long-term depression or could fail and make things much worse. Let's side with her and improve the whole world. Uh, so that's uh, the accounting profession. But, you know, I found out a, a couple of years after Sonia died uh, just how, um, how the young journalists are being trained because um, one of the people who was at... Um, Missouri School of Journalism, which is where Sonia went, uh, called up to interview me. And so I told them the story that I told you about what had happened with the National Press Club. And uh, of course, they, um, they taught that young journalist that uh, some stories should never see the light of day. Um, that's, that's really very sad. Um, so that's <laughs> what I had to say about journalism. So let's move on to the legal profession. Um, there are a lot of people who hold it against me that I'm a lawyer. And um, one, of the, one of the very sad things that I had, I had to discover was just um, how the legal profession has really not lived up to um, the way it's presented itself. They, the lawyers like to say that they, um, they also represent the downtrodden, that they're there to represent both sides of the story. But I can tell you that the legal profession, unfortunately, has been covering up the network of global corporate control. And um, when the lawyers, um, they license each other. The lawyers police their own profession. And um, they do this in a way that um, is, not, is not credible. So, for example, I went to the uh, District of Columbia Bar Association when the lawyers at the World Bank were taking documents and falsifying them and using them in the administrative tribunal inside the World Bank. Uh, this is something which is um, it's against the um, professional ethics. And those lawyers should have been disbarred. But the uh, Board of Professional Responsibility wouldn't, wouldn't touch them. There are other lawyers who have um, reported uh, much worse uh, things that the legal profession has done. And um, the lawyers are allowed to get away with it. Uh, there is no ethics at the very heart of the legal profession. Instead, you've got something called British Accreditation Registry, BAR. The lawyers are um, they're traitors, and there's um, something called the Inns of Court, which is in uh, London, 
Uh, and what, what that does is that provides a license to the lawyers to, um, to protect the network of global corporate control. Um, and I've been, uh, I've finally become quite outspoken. Uh, the American Bar Association um, tried to censor me uh, on this. I was writing an article in their journal and right in the middle they, they stopped um, allowing me to, to comment. This was an article on uh, what's called sovereign citizens. These are people who object to the fact that their names are being uh, used on the capital markets. Uh, and people who, who, use, um, who, who are called sovereign citizens have now been branded as uh, terrorists. Uh, so the legal profession is actually, um, they've taken sides. And uh, I've, I've made it very clear to the lawyers that uh, the time to switch is now. And if otherwise, it's not going to be, it's not going to be likely that there's going to continue to be a legal profession. Um, one of the things that um, I started out by saying, uh, people say that lawyers, when they um, are admitted to the courts, that's called admitted to the bar, that they take uh, secret oaths. And many lawyers don't realize about the ends of court or what's going on with the network of global corporate control. Uh, American attorneys um, usually, when they're swear, sworn they will swear allegiance to the constitution of the state that they're admitted to. Um, but whether they know it or not, the American Bar Association is a member of the Inns of Court, and lawyers are um, part of and parcel of this network of global corporate control. Uh, there, in, uh, the middle of the 1800s, there was a 13th Amendment in the Constitution which said that uh, lawyers were precluded from, um, from becoming, uh, serving in politics. And the reason they did this was because people felt that the lawyers were betraying their country. Uh, what happened during the Civil War was those um, copies of the Constitution that had that amendment in there were ripped up, but some people did research and they found out that um, this 13th Amendment was actually ratified and that it does belong in the Constitution. So when we get our Constitution back, the lawyers are going to have an uphill struggle because they have been so complicit with the network of global corporate control. Um, one of the things that you have with uh, the legal profession is something that says you're, um, you're allowed to uh, maintain the confidentiality of your client. And what this has done, actually, is that this has given a license to the network of global corporate control. And they have, um, <laughs> so that's, that's what I have to say on the legal profession, um, I'm sure. Uh, a lot of my audience has other tales to tell, but let's, let's move on to another profession. That's the accounting profession, uh, because um, that's also a group that polices itself, and uh, that's also a group that has not lived up to, um, to its profession. Uh, what I found out in the World Bank was that the financial statements were not, um, were not accurate. They were, um, they were being falsified, and any of the accountants that um, reported that the statements were being falsified were fired. Some of the accountants at the World Bank reported that uh, the borrowers were being charged interest that wasn't being calculated according to the formula, and those accountants were fired. Uh, this, you know, this really um, can't, you can't, you can't allow this to happen. 
And, um, but it, it does happen. Uh, one of the World Bank whistleblowers, Elaine Colville, reported that um, in, she worked for the uh, International Finance Corporation. And what was going on there was that um, her unit was um, being accounted for twice. The salaries were being charged twice in the financial statements. And that meant that the second time, somebody was able to use that money. Um, that was a way of uh, cooking the books. And when she tried to get this um, taken care of with the United Kingdom Parliament, um, they just gave her a runaround. Um, we, we finally got one of our statements up in the uh, UK uh, Parliament website. And she really, um, she really took them to task. And nothing has come of it. Uh, the UK Parliament, three of the members of Parliament, have asked um, whether uh, George Osborne, wh what, what he has to say about the fact that the United Kingdom is not accepting the gold that's on offer from the global debt facility. And um, George Osborne hasn't bothered to answer those point blank questions. Instead, he went to Bilderberg. And um, it's, <laughs> you know, uh, when I speak to some of the people in the United Kingdom, they say that there's, there's quite a cultural difference between the United Kingdom uh, citizens and the United States citizens. The, um, the people in the United Kingdom, um, when, they're, um, when they're past the pushing point, um, there's, there, there's really, they're, they're not, um, they, they shouldn't be tangled with. Um, I was reading an article about how in the United States acting profession that um, many of the, um, the UK actors are actually um, playing Americans. They're, um, they're better disciplined, they do a better job of acting, and uh, their accents are, are convincing enough. But um, getting back to the accounting profession and the way things are at the top, there's, um, there's a group called the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions. And uh, that group um, has given a free pass to the Network of Global Corporate Control. I went to them and I told them that KPMG, which was um, supposed to be auditing the World Bank's books, um, refused to allow me to talk to their audit team. Uh, they were giving an unqualified audit opinion, uh, which that's one of the rules that um, there's a group called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And uh, PCAOB, um, they didn't enforce their standards. Uh, the SEC didn't bother to enforce their standards. What these entities do is they simply present um, a good housekeeping seal to people. Um, they give the network of global corporate control a free pass to rip off everybody uh, when the reality is that that group is bankrupt and shouldn't, shouldn't be continuing. But the accountants find that this is, um, this is perfectly normal, this is perfectly fine. Uh, so when you have this kind of um, complicit behavior, it's, um, it's really, it's going to be very difficult when we do get our gold and when we do have a different currency, we're going to have to try to come to terms with how we manage our finance, our international financial system. We certainly can't delegate to the lawyers or the accountants, or the journalists. Um, we're going to have to do a much more hands-on. Uh, we're not going to leave things to the experts. There's another group that um, I tangled with. Those are the people who um, like to, to say that uh, there's compliance. They're the, the ethics officers. There were two ethics officers at the World Bank that I dealt with that were members of uh, the Ethics Officers Association. 
Um, and they were actually trying to do their job. Um, one of them uh, left. Uh, another one who replaced her also left. And so I went to the Ethics and Compliance Officers Association uh, to speak to these two officers, Anita Baker. And um, they were actually very surprised to see me there. Jackie Gates was the second one. And I said, you know, um, things have really, um, have really gotten very tangled up. Uh, what, what do you think you ought to do about this? And um, they, they didn't have a good answer. Um, I've been trying to get that ethics officer's compliance uh, to admit the fact that there is no compliance on the capital markets. And we, you know, we haven't admitted this. So how are we, how are we going to, um, how are we going to manage the transition? How are we going to, um, we will have to have accurate finances, um, but it's not clear how we're going to manage this. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, people are going to have to um, figure out. Uh, I showed in the previous episode a clip of um, how it is when a sailboat comes about, sails on a different tack. And there's only one way uh, that a boat is able to come about, and that is for all of the people to work together and to realize that we're shifting. We're shifting to a different paradigm. And the different paradigm that we're going to have to shift to is to call a spade a spade, is not to delegate to professions that, um, that don't police their, um, their brothers or brethren. Uh, the legal profession is, uh, at the moment, 18 percent, um, there are 18 percent smaller classes in law schools because um, people realize that this profession is, um, it's, it's going to be dying out. Uh, and when we talk about ethics, it's also very important to figure out what our own ethics are. And very often it's hard for us to admit to ourselves when we're not um, playing straight. That's really one of the hardest things. Everybody, um, we're all human and it's, it's not easy to see our own foibles. Uh, there's one way that, that we, can, we can do a better job, and that's if we all learn to, um, to accept criticism and for the people that are the closest to us um, to, to tell us what it is that we don't want to know but that we need to know. And if you open yourself up to that kind of, um, that kind of learning, then it's possible to make progress. And we really do have to make progress. Um, it's, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be fun, I think, for us to learn how to work together and how to accept the fact that, um, that we can't leave it up to the experts. Uh, because the experts have left us in the lurch. Uh, and when we talk about journalism, we have to learn how to recognize when we're being duped and admit it. And we have to get, um, we have to get our acts together. And um, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, and as we recognize that we've been duped, we're going to have to learn how to, um, how to manage the, um, with the people who have duped us. Uh, it takes two. The one who's accepted the lie and hasn't looked into, uh, rigorously looked into what's going on. So frequently I'll get an email from somebody um, asking me what I think of, of, of a topic. And, you know, there's a lot that I'm trying to do. Um, and I'm usually asking for help. But for me to have to be somebody's librarian, that's, you know, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And I get people that, that, that um, they take offense at that. They think I should be um, 
their librarian. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be. Um, people are going to have to uh, become more self-sufficient. We have a special problem with the courts in the United States because the judges are impersonating judges who are on the courts that we're entitled to under the Constitution. Those are courts called Article III courts that sit in equity. Um, what our judges are doing is they're employees of the network of global corporate control. And they're sitting in special administrative courts. And the way they, um, they manage to do this is when you sign your bank signature card, there's a fine print underneath which says, subject to bank rules. And if you read the bank rules, those rules say, I waive my right to a real court. And, then, and the reason we know this is because the clerk of court in New York um, wrote a book. It's called um, Hidden Contracts. And so I went to um, the clerks in the District of Columbia, and I asked them um, to admit that they were not sitting in real courts. And they refused to do that. So um, that means that they have broken their oath of office, and there is insurance on those oaths. So I went to the insurance companies, and I asked the insurance companies, um, I told them they were going to have to pay all of those uh, surety bonds. That's a lot of insurance, uh, all of the federal judiciary uh, breaking their oaths of office. I also went to the Senate Committee on the Judiciary to see what they had to say about it. Um, they wouldn't admit to it. So um, <laughs> it's, really, um, it's really quite serious, the kind of judicial reform that we're going to have to be um, involved in. And what do we do about the ongoing court cases? Um, what do we do about um, the judiciary? Do we fire them all? and uh, hire new judges, we have an enormous task on our hands. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to resolve all of these questions immediately. We can sequence these issues. Um, people call me up. They tell me about um, the terrible things that have happened. And we have a question about restitution. Are we just going to... Um, allow people to have been victimized, to have their houses taken away from them. Uh, we have enormous issues to deal with. And um, there are not going to be any easy answers. This, this transition away from the network of global corporate control to um, the rule of law is going to, it's going to take us um, a long time. I don't want to say how many years it's going to take us. But the thing that's, um, that's reassuring to me is that um, people are really interested in, in correcting these problems. They're interested in leaving a different world for their children. Uh, it's an exciting time that we have. Uh, one of the, um, the issues that I'd like to stay involved in, I can't be involved in too many issues, um, it's, and these, these problems are going to go forward um, for a long time. But one of the issues that I want to stay involved in is to make sure that people, um, whistleblowers, are not retaliated against. Because that's one way that we will know that we're making real progress. Um, and we have to make real progress. Uh, but the best, the best thing is that... Um, I think we are up to the task um, because uh, it's been uh, insurmountable odds to have gotten this far. And the only way that I've gotten this far is because I'm just part of the team and a lot of people are working on these issues. Um, I'd like to give special recognition to the people 
at DCTV that have been working on these issues. But I'd also like to recognize Larry Garrison. Uh, he's my PR guy, and he has stayed with me through um, thick and thin. And believe me, if he hadn't, um, there was no way that I could have continued. And he's been under some pressure, too. So um, the good news is that um, we are, we're all aware of this problem uh, as we now see it. And there's a lot that we're going to be, we're, we're going to be discovering a lot more. Um, but the, the, the best part that we're going to be discovering is the, um, the strength of the human spirit. Uh, because we have made it this far. And the fact that we've made it this far means that we're going to go all the way. Uh, and what does all the way mean? It means, in terms of the global currency reset, that the paper currencies are replaced by absolute assets, uh, either gold in the currency, the actual currency, or silver, or if a country wants something else, they can do it. But um, there's not going to be any interest charged on um, fake currency where the interest leaves the country and goes to the network of global corporate control. That's not going to be, um, that's not going to continue. Uh, and we're going to make the world um, in each little corner. Nobody at the World Bank is going to come and tell anybody how to run their country. That's against the articles of the World Bank. And um, if we're able to, uh, the World Bank's role is going to be just simply to get the gold to the currencies and um, not to do anything other than that. Um, this is going to be um, the end of this uh, segment. We're discussing how many more segments there ought to be. Um, I'd like to hear from you whether you think it's uh, useful to be briefed like this um, because if you're going to be briefed by the network of global corporate control uh, you're not going to be um, hearing anything other than um, liar liar pants on fire thank you for watching another segment of the network of global corporate control We've discussed how people are uncovering the corruption at the center of the world's currencies. They're not going to pay interest on country debt to the world's central banks, when in truth, it's these banks that have been owing us the money. Until next week, I'm your host, Karen Hudis.